of years for a lot of these guys. What? Hi. Right. It's been two years. Hey, Jim Simonic. Jim Simonic, the last time we did any of this, it was for you. Oh, God. Hey, Dan, did you stretch? Are you ready to fucking do this? Ethan and I, my brother and I were kids, we, uh, you know, we were just, from the moment I can remember, we were surrounded by things that had to do with music. There was a piano in the house, there were guitars in the house, there was music around, and the ability to make your own if you wanted. My dad didn't make any bones about it, he liked to bring this idea of us playing instruments and playing music into the house. The first instrument I ever played was cello, which is not a very cool instrument. Um, although it was a fun instrument and I wish I had kept doing it because it's pretty cool now. Music really helped me overcome a lot of things, socially, personally. Um, uh, in middle school, my family, we lived in Hawaii, uh, on the island of Oahu. And I was pretty much the only, you know, white, fat kid, uh, whatever, but wearing metal shirts to school. I started out by uh, playing the violin, you know, nice. one of those things, you know, Every, every Japanese parent wants their child to go <laughs> play uh, some, some tiny little embarrassing instrument. I think I got my first guitar when I stopped playing sports. And that was probably a result of like Slash. It's like, oh yeah, Guns N' Roses, gotta get me a guitar. When people started to realize that I was a drummer and I could play pretty well, well, that kind of transcended a lot of social crapola that I was dealing with at the time. For many years after that, it was, it, was, uh, it was guitar until I discovered the bass and just kind of realized how to create tones that can shake things and I, I kind of like, kind of gravitated towards that. When we were kids, Kiss was like it, you know, Kiss. And then when Van Halen came out, Van Halen was just the next step of like, okay, this is something that affects me in such a way that like, I think this is what I'm gonna do with my life. I think really punk is where it started for me. I found this record by, that had this giant front two, 242 on it and this, this soldier and I just thought it was the most amazing looking thing. I didn't know what it sounded like, but I was like, I gotta listen to see what the, this, this is amazing. Bought it and then that was it. That's when I heard about uh, Ministry. There, um, in case you didn't feel like showing up album was out and I heard that and I was like what is that that's this is this is nutty man like what I don't are there power drills on stage what are these people doing the first band I was ever in was a band with Jason and uh, and we were called 312 and we would play like backyard parties <laughs> school I have like old notebooks that I've saved where you can see the name Acumen being like made into a logo and a fun, you know, scribbling it out then it started with uh, you know playing with little drum machines and stuff and making tapes the first thing that I ever did was this euthanasia cassette and uh, I don't know where this euthanasia idea came from uh, you know you spelling it youth in Asia and there are literally even though when I finally did press that one euthanasia cassette and I put it in type and there were four songs on each side and I sent it away and got it done and got 100 or 200 copies made there were literally you know a hundred one-off copies made before that with these three songs and then these two songs and then nope that wasn't right I would then I'd make a new song and be like that should be on there and it took a year to finally settle down and say all right this is what I'm going to say to represent who, you know, represent who we are. So then we started playing around with ideas with my brother and, and a couple friends of ours. 
uh, you know, rappers, guys that were poets, you know, graphic artists, and we were really probably inspired the most by Skinny Puppy, at least as being a multimedia project. And with, you know, ministry and, and, and a lot of the bands in that industrial vein and era at that time were doing really cool things with projection and, you know, fences and all that shit and smoke and whatever you want. So that was something that he wanted to incorporate into that. So that led to like having, you know, we had Super 8 cameras and we had these things. We started putting together a band and we sent out a couple of tapes. And uh, this club, The Avalon, gave us our first show in 91. There was a guy on guitar, there was Jason on vocals, there were dancers. There was all this projection and smoke machines and you know, jelly and all kinds of crap. Uh, a friend of mine said, hey, there's this guy who's looking for uh, like a bass player. And I had played bass as well as playing drums. Um, and I think it was just one of those things where she mentioned him and I went and saw a show and it seemed kind of cool. It was very arty at the time. So I started playing bass with them and then Ethan would play guitar and a lot of times we had uh, backing tapes and then at one point we just decided, hey, let's, let's put some real drums. We noticed the reaction from people when we would start to play more as a band was a lot stronger. And people seemed to identify with you a little bit more when you were playing a guitar or something versus, you know, playing a keyboard. And it all felt like, you know, like, this is all making sense. And I literally, I don't know, this had to be 92, barged into the wax tracks offices and I remember I had this huge green army overcoat. I said, I have a demo cassette I really like, you must have put it on a desk and they said, oh, okay, cool, we'll give it to him. And I was like, all right, thank you. Walked out, I was like, I just slayed the demon, I walked in, I just did that. The next day, I come home and I check, and on my message, there's a voicemail from Jim Nash. This is 24 hours later and Jim Nash, the, the uh, the founder of Wax Tracks uh, is leaving this message on my machine saying, hey, this is Jim Nash from Wax Tracks. We don't usually talk to anybody about unsolicited demos or anything, blah, 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 but this Acumen cassette has been on playing in the office now for the last day, and we really like what you're doing. I will never forget how exciting it was to have that man leave this message on my machine. And now to this day, I can either say this was the, the luckiest or the, or the worst thing. I told them, well, actually, we have a show tonight at the Avalon. They come to the show, it's the Avalon, and let's just say the show was a complete disaster. I mean, we were still doing things that, you know, I'm embarrassed about now. And we knew it too, and the next day they said, so we were at the show, and I was like, I, I don't know what to say. And he's like, that's cool, we're, we still like the music a lot. And I'm like, we obviously have a long way to go. starting to realize that we wanted to have the drums playing full time. So the thing was to get another guitar player because then it was Jason would just be playing guitar by himself. So I was terrible at playing guitar and singing at the same time. Still find it something that like I think you have to just know how to do. You're born with it. I'm convinced. All of a sudden there was this guy that was there. It's like who's that kid? He had, Jamie had really long dark hair. And he was pale white and, and skinnier than like you know. Jarvis Cocker, it was crazy. He was a, um, an engineer, like a second engineer at Chicago Tracks where we did a lot of recording. And uh, he was just at our sessions and then we're playing shows and all of a sudden here's this kid who's like moving amps and tuning guitars and doing stuff. He just was like, one day there was like a light switch and then boom, Jamie was just there. You know, and his, name, his nickname, you know, he was the kid back then because he was so eager and so young and so baby faced and just so excited. and. You know, we were relatively young too, but it was just, there was a now a younger, you know, somebody exciting to feed into what we were already doing. But I think Jamie's first show was uh, uh, shows that we did at the Metro opening for Chem Lab and KMFDM. I remember, you know, coming to his, his first show and just being so surprised and excited and seeing, you know, my son on stage and he's very happy doing what he's doing. He was in, but we were like, you motherfucker. We went through three or four years now of just punishment, playing in some horrible clubs with shitty gear in front of 20 people. And you join the band and within two weeks, you're in front of five, 600 people at a sold out Metro show playing in front. Like you, you got in at the right time, man.
right when the stuff started with with Jared uh, reaching out to us, you know, from Chem Lab and Fifth Column, and within like a week or two of playing that show, we were on our way to putting a deal together with Fifth Column to put out a record with them. They were sort of looking to branch out, and I think we just, we sort of fit what they were doing at the time. So I don't know if we were the second or third or maybe the fourth band that they signed. Um, and then uh, we went into Chicago Tracks and recorded with uh, Keith Fluffy Auerbach, who was Ministry's longtime engineer. And the five of us are all hunched over this old Harrison, like no moving faders or anything like that. When we had to do our edits, it was like, okay, you ready? Roll the track, and you'd have to print it to tape, like doing all of your shit by hand, and it was, it was a trip of a process. Just knowing that if you put that song on in a club, that people could listen to it, but they could also dance to it. I think that was like the initial, um, really the initial act of fun. So at first it was like, oh yeah, like this is, I've kind of heard stuff like this before, like Zoltar plays kind of things like this, like no, 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 that like, breakdown in Matador was like totally my jam. At the time I was DJing, you know, and loving all things industrial, I was always kind of looking for like the next song that, you know, I could get people on the dance floor. You know, because you could get people on the floor of like Nitzarab and Skinny Puppy and Ministry, that was easy, that was, you know, it's a no-brainer. But to find some of these other new acts that were coming up, and there was a lot of them at the time, a lot of new bands. And uh, this, this tune, Gun Lover, and I, I loved it. I just absolutely loved this tune. It was great. That was the one kind of stronghold song. It was just like the yell, I don't fucking care. I don't fucking care. I ended up calling up Jason, and we started talking. And, and you know, this guy was just so down to earth. He was just so down to earth, you know? And I was like, look, you know, I, I liked him, you know, so much just from talking to him on the phone. I'm like, we're going out on our, t you know, our next tour. You know, we need a band to go out with. And I was like, well, you know, why don't you guys come out with us? He was in Chicago working in a studio. They did the Iron Icon. He had gone on tour and we were, they called and their booking agent called us and you want to go out on this. So of course we think like, yeah, there's bands and agents asking us to go on tour. Hell yeah. And we were giving them like, you know, all the bits because you know we were on our third tour so we felt like we were pros at that time like we had already kind of broke our chariot a little bit so we're like helping out the younger brother and we're like well this is what you got to do buddy you know you got to get yourself a van you know don't you get your tour support and you got to you know invest it into a van you know don't waste it on a rental jamie was like it's cool man my mom got us this van through like an uncle or something it was the first dodge caravans like the first the smallest minivan you could get like you could, it wasn't even the extended small one. And we're just looking at it and looking at our gear going like, how the hell are we gonna pull this off? But it was just so awful and it was just embarrassing, but it was the best that anybody could come up with at the time. And there's this sign that says like, gusty winds next two miles or something. And I'm driving. And you can't see, like you can't see out of the back of this thing or anything. And I'm just I'm driving, blah, blah, blah. And I hear this, like this, flappity flap 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 sound with like a gust of wind. I'm like, hmm, I wonder what that was. And I look up and there's nothing on the roof. The racks are gone, all our shit's gone, all our personal bags, the drum hardware, it's gone. It was brutal. But now when we tell these stories, they're, they're great, right? But at the time, this was awful. And they're sitting like on the precipice of almost going over this giant dead cliff of, you know, 500 feet or something is all of our stuff. And it's just sitting there almost fulcrum like doo, 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 doo. And I'm just thinking to myself, like, we are so lucky. We were all sunburned, you know, we, we drove all night. It was a 12-hour drive to Atlanta. Dawn breaks in Atlanta and we pull into a gas station and we all fall asleep in the in this embankment and wake up five hours later, burnt crispy from laying out and falling asleep in the sun. And we did these shows over the next three days just barely able to play and beat red str straps that you know like your face and poor little these none of these guys had ever been in the sun before none of the clay people Jamie I mean they're just like so miserable so during this tour that we do with them there's a lot of moments of dead time waiting we get to venues early a promoter doesn't show up we play through a couple of jams and then we somehow start noodling around with what has always been my favorite dance song ever at the time, Join in the Chant, um, by Nitsa Reb. We realized how easy it is to play on the guitar, live drums, and then we're like, what if we 
you know, and then Dan or somebody else says, well, my favorite has always, always been murderous. So we're like, what if we like medley the two of these together? At the end of every show, we did this song and, you know, just we wanted like this wall of guitars, you know, and, and this big beat in the background and two vocalists. And you take this band that was pure electronic and keyboards and give them just that little metal touch, you know, and, and uh, you know, so at the end of the gig, if they didn't really know the bands too well, they would know that we came in there and did this cover of, of uh, Nitzareb and it would pound and they would say, yeah, that was a good show. Nice. A couple days later, we end up in San Diego, and that is where Chase, the owner of Reconstriction that, that the Clay people assigned to, and now Chase is really aware of who we are too. We put a song out on a comp, um, you know, and he's very, uh, this is so exciting. I mean, this guy, I think he took us to lunch, you know, and for us, this was huge. And we play that night, and now we've done it a couple times, so we do the Nitzareb thing, and he's blown away by it. He was just a huge industrial fan to begin with. For us to come out with this classic tune, you know, he absolutely just loved it. And he's blown away by it at the end, and he goes, what the hell was that? And I'm like, and like oh, that's our new band, that's the Iron Lung Corp. And he goes, really? Iron Lung Corp, do you guys have songs? He was talking to Jason and I, and he was like, you know, is this a real band? And we're like, oh yeah. You know, and, and I jump in, and I'm like, we have a whole album written. You know, and we didn't have anything written. We had one tune. And he's like, well, I want it, I want it. So, and Jason stepped in, and he was like, oh yeah, we had this this whole project that we did, you know, and it's all together, and of course that was a complete farce. We didn't have anything except for this tune. And we're just spitting this to me, because like, you gotta let me put it out, you gotta let me put it out. Like, uh, all right, well, you know, pretending we're like winking at each other. Convincing that we have a whole album full of songs. Right off the bat says, here's, this is the money I'm gonna give you. And we were excited, because it, the first time in our lives, we, we felt like we were kinda, you know, we were in control of something finally. It just so happens that we had already re renegotiated with, with Fifth Column to do our second record. And we realized that we have these budgets and we have like similar due dates for these albums. So we realized, why don't we parlay that money together, buy a big chunk of time at Chicago Tracks, and do both albums at the same time. Just by complete coincidence, the same time that we book for midnight sessions from 12 a.m. to 12 p.m., 16 volt books a week with Critter to do Let Down Crush from the day sessions from 12 p.m. to 12 a.m. I think before we came out, Jamie actually gave me a call on the phone and was like, hey, um, you know, you're, I see you're on the schedule, because he was working at Tracks at that point, Chicago, uh, Chicago Tracks. And um, yeah, I remember him calling me and just saying, oh, I'm just, you know, like stoked that you're coming out and like huge fan or whatever. The only band that I even remotely liked in that scene was 60 Volt, and I think it's because of the, the melodies. They were writing hooks like we were writing, you know? There was a 7-Eleven that was a half a block away from tracks that was in a predominantly gay and lesbian neighborhood. So they had some really interesting porn. I think they had like one or two more sessions left, and we fucking covered the entire control room with male porn. You'd pick up the phone and there'd be a dick under the phone or something. And then there was a blow up doll like on top of the console and they just like had taken the liberty of like redecorating and uh, you know. So we just kind of walked in and it was, it was a good laugh. So anyway, that was a real fun time because we recorded that album over those 12 days. Every single day in a row we tracked, we tracked both albums at the same time. Back to back, you know, some days the clay people would be there, the two guys that were doing Iron Lung. And that's how Big Shiny Spears came about. You know, we should just promote it as clay people and acting right off the cuff. I don't know who we were tricking, you know, except maybe ourselves. You know, in the end, we the, the whole Iron Lung is a, 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 it's such a great joke, but the only people laughing at it was us. <laughs> Everybody, you know, Jason and all of us, we were all itching to get to territory because we knew the songs were kind of a little bit grander. They had a more of a function with the way we played as a band because you gotta remember all the stuff from transmissions is left over from when the band was merging into a band. And I think what what territory in particular 
the band started to soften up on, I think, what Jason was singing about, and, and the guitars were melodic as well as like really heavy and chunky, and I think that was really an attempt to say, like, all right, well, if there is a genre that we're working in, do we have to be defined by what the people before us did, or can we do something different? And that one was, you know, self-produced, and a lot of a lot of creativity and a lot of good ideas, and I think. And in a lot of ways, maybe still our best record territory. We had just finished a tour, and it was maybe like two months or like a month and a half. And uh, that Chem Lab 16 volt tour, we, it came together really quickly. Fucking 16 volt Chem Lab are playing, and we're gonna watch them every night for a month and a half. That's cool. And they were the same way. They're like, dude, we get to watch Acumen every night. This is a blast. Like, we're having fun with all these guys. I think at the time we knew that this, this is, the, this is the, the Cold Wave tour, and we were all really excited to be a part of it. But we had nowhere to sleep. You know, we'd sleep in rest areas, people's houses. I mean, you know, we'd be at the end of the show, we'd be like, hey, can we stay at someone's house? You know? like sleeping in rest areas and just like whatever we had to do to like get out and play music. Whenever they came through Chicago, um, I would make these big band dinners. And uh, I remember Chem Lab coming through and um, my boss was there and she's like, this is just so strange. She says, I'm talking with these people with, you know, mohawks and blue hair and piercings all over and we're talking about when they're in 4-H and I'm like, yeah, these are all great people, you know? Walked into Metro and I was like, who are these guys? Who is this band? Who are these guys? I was like, they're like going to be famous man. It's the greatest band in the whole world. I was completely blown away. Um, like they were tight as hell, smoke everywhere, like two Ibanez Iceman on stage and they opened with Matador. I was like, holy crap, like so much better than recording at that time, in my opinion. We used to just follow them on the road. Like, I didn't even know anything about music. I was just like, I really like acumen and working out with them, you know. And uh, they were always just, they were never assholes. It was so weird. It was like the first time I ever met a band I really liked, and they were responsive. This is about another band called Acumen. They are from Cincinnati, and they suck. And they played here a couple months ago. And I sincerely hope that you see another man called Acumen, you will happily fight Bob for us. Thank you. We had been using and Jason just himself, you know, like there were so many uh, early demos and tapes that he released and things like that. He had been using the name for a really long time. My understanding was that this other band in Ohio found out that we were using the name too. And even though we had been using it longer, they went and trademarked the name and then turned around and sued us. I don't even know how this like little band you know, from Cleveland, you know, would want to take something away from somebody that already put out a couple records. A month later, this guy comes back, this high-powered lawyer, and tells our friend, I have some bad news, they kind of got you. They have actual copyright about six months before you ever copyrighted anything or released anything. So this badass that we thought would scare the shit out of these little hucksters, they, uh, they didn't, it didn't work and we had to start realizing like if this does go to court we are going to lose, you know. And there's a whole thing where we did this collective show in Chicago with some other artists. And instead of even Jim Marcus from Die Wars, I was involved in that and a couple of other people. And so we thought of it as this collective, we were going to call it Acumen Nation. And then we'd already done the show and Jay was like, why don't we just call it Acumen Nation? And we were all like, that's pretty good, yeah, why not? And that was when we kind of, you know, conceded to the name change. But it's funny because if you go and look now, you search online, if people talk about Acumen, nine times out of ten, it's going to be a reference to us and not to them. So maybe even though we didn't have the legal issues, I think history on our side worked in our favor.
And then fifth column is starting to fall apart because of whatever business practices and we realize that label's going under. So, you know, all the bands who were on that label, subsequently their contracts were ended and in another way it was great because we were free, but then we were also, you know, man without a country. We had no place to go. And that is when a friend of ours named Gray Parker and, and a band that we knew, Sister Soleil, his friends, they had a small label in New York called Conscience, and at that time they had just, they were in the middle of negotiating, signing Power Man 5000 over to DreamWorks. When I saw them live, not only were they playing really well, but then they were changing instruments during the set, and just, they obviously had this, um, they had this all figured out. They knew exactly what they wanted to do. They knew exactly what they wanted to sound like. And they knew that they were going to deal with uh, Acumen being changed to Acumen Nation. And they knew that we were writing more song-oriented, you know, melody music. But they, they were smart and they were into it. Conscience was definitely the first time we felt like we were going to have a home. On, on a label and have support and they wanted to do singles and shit like that. And they had the whole next album which turned out to be more Human Heart. Um, they were starting to write it already, they had it in mind, they were doing some of the shows, some of the songs and shows live. Um, and so they recorded that record in Chicago and then came out to New York and mixed and mastered it in New York with us. It's still, this is going to sound hokey and ironic because of the album title, but there is so much heart in that record. Like the, you can tell that they wrote it with great passion. I look back on that record now, and I'm like, oh my god, how could we have done some of those songs? How could we have just gotten that sappy? You know, uh, I think they're amazing songs for another band that you know that could have done them, or maybe us later on. But I think, you know, we were just again just doing what we wanted to do, and we didn't stop for a minute to go like. Should we really put this acoustic-y Cancerine song on here? I think we took for granted the, the fan base that we had, so we wanted to make this rock epic record, which, you know, thank God enough people liked. And, you know, I love it as a record, but as a career decision, I'm going to say probably would have advised against a couple of those tunes, you know. That was one of those things where I think like the build-up was really, really big, and then the record came out, and then I, I just kind of felt like maybe it didn't, it didn't uh, go the way they wanted to, and that was kind of it. There was uh, a, a point where my path and my partner's paths diverged, personally and professionally, and very quickly he made the decision to end the label. Um, and so all of a sudden one day Conscience was gone. I think they felt betrayed by that. I think they were disappointed. I know I was. We had been going really hard for like many, 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 many years. And uh, I think I got to around 1997 or 1998. And, and I mean, I was a little older than everybody else in the band. And I just started, started looking and thinking like, I don't know how much longer I can do this or I don't know if this is gonna go the way I want it to go. One of the things too, just on a personal level is, I really enjoy playing drums and it was kind of hard the way the current band stuff was because Ethan was doing half the drums, I was doing the other half of the drums. We were having some battles, he and I, and uh, he had basically thrown down the gauntlet saying like, either I'm going to leave the band or Ethan's going to leave the band. I think there was just a point where I was like, you know, I think I'm done. Within six months I moved away from Chicago and uh, I stopped playing music. And I just needed like two or three years to just like get, you know, get back to enjoying life and, and not feeling like uh, music was the only thing that I was doing. It's so easy to talk about a lot of these memories now, but I mean, we really, I mean, a lot of this was brutal. You know, we got, you know, very little money that, you know, a lot of debt. You know, a lot of hard miles, a lot, you know, got the shit kicked out of us, played to more empty rooms than full. And after a while, it takes a toll on you. So then Pez is out, and then we need a bass player. So we knew this guy, Eric Alvarez, through a mutual friend, and uh, he just kind of fit. We were feeling disillusioned with the industrial scene. You know, there, there was a time period there for a couple of years where I swore to God, 
you know, the major labels were going to come calling for industrial rock and they were going to pick up people like Acumen and 16 Volt, uh, Killing Floor and Clay People and Diatribe. But you know what happened? All those majors got interested, but they found their own bands and their own babies and they didn't want anything to do with bands that had already fucking went out and, and spent two years on the road and had back catalog. So that coupled with the fact that new metal was blowing up in Chicago and we were big fans of Deftones and we're like, you know what, all we have to do is, we have people, we have people, we have to just reshape this a little bit. I was trying to weed out some of the electronics just because I thought it was, it was squeezing the creativity of the band to, to, to think that you had to do it this certain way. Um, so by the time we get to, with Eric Alvarez, we're writing these tunes and, and everything's great. It's like, yeah, let's just do all rock, an all rock record. That would be so much fun. And that's, you know, the, like you look at that record, we had no money, none. We basically all chipped in enough money to go get a few days of tracks. The record was recorded in two or three days. And if you look back, if we had only thought at that moment, put out the meanest, most beat heavy industrial thing and grab hold of something that's just waiting for somebody to do it, we did the opposite and we tried to write some poppy, new metal kind of stuff that we were into, put a few little sound effects and industrial stuff in there to keep, you know, but it wasn't enough in this, and people could smell out what we were doing. I was playing in a, this punk band out in Illinois, so really fast, you know, not quite hardcore, but just fast type little punk band, and that was short-lived. I heard, hey, this band you know, needs a bassist. Like, hey, uh, I play bass. This this is the five string bass we were telling you guys about. It's basically the five strings. Eric, I'm yeah. sorry we haven't called you yet. Oh. oh yeah, you gotta tell Eric Alvarez in case this is the first you're seeing of it. We replaced you with. Oh, <laughs> sorry, so bad. Welcome. We'll go to the bar. You never should have moved away. We were playing shows for Strike Four. It was, it was just a rock set, you know, just stripped down, four piece rock and roll, um, no electronics. We didn't play Queener. We didn't play you know, gun lover or anything. And not only did we not get picked up, but we also alienated half of our fans who were like, this is not the band that I liked. And it was a crushing time. Ethan then was the next one to go. He's like, yeah, I'm not really into this. I was starting my own band, a different band that I had, and I was contributing more time to that and just didn't really have the time to, to do both and, and said, hey, Jay, I'm going gonna, gonna to go my own way. And that's when we decided like we were going to do this one last show at House of Blues, and, uh, and that was going to be it for a little while. We are just going to see what happens. Acumen was, for the most part, finished at that point. that we you know we're friends with and that were part of our like what we you know I guess the cold waves crew now but the clay people in 16 volt here's all these bands getting signed to this new label in Chicago called slip disc and they have a bunch of money and they have mercury distribution and so we're in there we're talking to them and we're getting to be friends with the people that run the thing and they go yeah we are really thinking about trying to get into that that DJ side of things 
And I go, oh, yeah, well, in Jamie and I have been talking to people keep bothering us about just wanting to hear our backing tracks without all the guitars and all the drums and all the vocals. Everybody just wants to hear, you know, the electronics. Some of that stuff's really dancing. He's like, do you know about, you know, and they're ask, asking us, like, do you know about DJ culture and club culture and stuff like that? And we're like, sure we do. This is funny. This sounds just like the Iron Lung story, right? And so next thing you know, there we're signing a deal to, for a de another couple of bucks, like holy shit, to start this imprint, and we called it Lost in Bass, and you know, we came up with the with that sort of the, the Accu Crack thing, and then we're like, oh, we're gonna call it DJ Accu Crack, but we fucking hate DJs, and we think DJ culture is just ridiculous, so it's gonna be DJ question mark because we're never gonna spin other people's music. It's just gonna be our music. booking agent, uh, he's booking this SeaTech, and SeaTech is the guys from Cubanate, who we've also become really friendly with, with Jean-Luc Demeyer singing. Jean-Luc Demeyer from Front 242 is going to be singing for this band SeaTech, and they're putting out a record and they want to do a tour of the States, and the booking agent would like to know if Jamie and I would like to go out and ride in the van with them and, and be Aki Crack, so we're like, hell yeah. And I know that there was that of like here's drum and bass and here's a bunch of different sounds and pulling them all together and they did such a great job of pulling all that stuff together and just feeling like why are they responding so easily to what's happening I think a lot of us were sitting there kicking and screaming and wanting industrial to stay what it was you know but here are these guys who just had no problem embracing the future uh, the Sea Tech tour is great Jean-Luc is great that is so much fun I mean the bond that we made with those the guys in Cubanate that were playing with Sea Tech I mean to this day I think Jean-Luc is just a fascinating dude um, two months later, Cubanate says, we want to go out on tour now, fuck that. You know, C-Tech went so great, Cubanate can only be better, right? And about three-fourths of the way through that tour, towards the end, we're in uh, San Antonio, Texas, and we're on stage, and we're getting ready to sound check, and Mark Heal, the singer of Cubanate, comes storming into that club. He's like, you fucking motherfuck, son of a bitch, pussy, god fucking asshole. Every name in the book, and Jamie and I are like, oh shit, what did we do? He says, you motherfuckers got the curve to her. And Jamie and I look at each other, we're like, what are you talking about? And he goes, you got the fucking curve to her. We get on the phone, and he's like, dudes, I don't know what to tell you, but, you know, uh, Curve is coming to the U.S., and they were looking for a band, and I put Cubanate up for it, and they called back, and they were like, this is cool, but we need something a little bit more DJ style, so I sent them you, and they picked you. And with by the next night, we've quietly... Got all of our gear put to the side and we've, we've uh, uh, got a couple air airplane tickets booked and we're like, guys, enjoy the rest of the tour, we gotta go home. In between those tours, in between the Cubanate tour and the SeaTech tour, was when I found out that uh, my girlfriend was pregnant. I'd gotten really sick and, you know, Jason had taken me to the hospital and they're like, um, you're pregnant. And we looked at each other like, what? What do you mean? Are you kidding me? And, you know, at the time, that was how I made a living. I, I wasn't not going to go, and, you know, we just had decided that, okay, this is happening. And Jason just looked at me and he's like, I'm going to go do this. This is going to be great for us. You know, this is going to bring in some income that we really need right now to have this kid. And I just looked at him and I'm like, I trust you. It still was really tough to enjoy myself on that Curve Tour because I knew that life was going to change, you know, so I was a little uptight. I was pretty anxious. Flip just starts to lose its, its it loses mercury distribution. It, it, it has written too many checks that it can't cash and their business practices are starting to bite them on the ass. It was a, was a travesty, mostly because I didn't give anybody any advance warning. It was just sort of like, for us, we were actually out on tour when, when that happened, and we were getting tour support checks. I mean, I remember, you know, clay people really sort of getting fucked in that sort of thing, because clay people at that point were at a really critical juncture where they could have really blown up. In the middle of this tour, we had to cancel and come home. You know, because like, that was it, that was, the money was gone. I think at the time that's when AccuCrack got rescued again. The Crack Nation, you know, crew still lives on because this label Imagine 
that Rorschach test signs to in New York in, in, in 1999. They basically wanted to sign us and started talking to us the minute they just heard a little bit of music and looked at it because they just needed somebody to have. And uh, I just had a baby girl and so we made this record sorted and because of my friendship with Curve, asked Tony if she'd be interested in singing a song on this record. And she said, sure, send me some. And I actually sent her four songs thinking that one, two, and three, one of those she's gonna pick. And she picked the So To Speak thing. Now our album was a little noisier and had a little more industrial, still kind of leanings to it. But that label, imagine, jumped on So To Speak. And they wanted to just put all this money into So To Speak, work it as a single, and pay people to remix it. And I'm screaming going, guys, Listen to the radio for 24 hours and tell me how many female voices you hear. This was the barren desert of female vocals time. This was fucking Fred Durst and his little red cap. There was no women. And I, I'm sorry, but they went ahead with the goddamn single. They put it out and paid thousands of dollars to hire a radio company to push it to radio when there wasn't a single female voice on the radio. And that shit didn't get played. But it's a great song. A lot of people loved it. Friends of ours here who owned a company wanted to make a video and they, they put a year into it. So when they released this amazing groundbreaking video, one of the first videos ever recorded with HD cameras, it was just too late. A friend of mine who worked for Palm Pictures, where I, uh, I worked at Manga Video, the anime company, and they were owned by Palm Pictures, and they were in the same building as Imagine. And the guy calls me like months after this is all over, and he's like, "Hey, aren't you? You're Jason, right?" And he's like, "Yeah, we're in the same company together." And he's like, "You also have this thing called DJ Accucrack, right?" And I said, "Yeah." He's like, "I just thought you should know that the dumpster in our fucking building is filled with." with like cases of your CDs. And I said, dude, I know we don't know each other. I will, whatever it takes, can you go get some of those? I will pay the shipping, I will buy you dinner. A week later, I got a big box from UPS filled with 30 count boxes. Some of them were cracked because they threw them in there, but those motherfuckers just ditched stuff. And that happens all the time, man. There's bands out there that would love to have that stuff and labels just don't give two shits about it. And everybody else is looking around like, what are we going to do? What am I going to do? And I'm the only one going, I know what I'm going to do. You guys have fun in the music business. I'm going to go over here and be a dad. And, uh, you know, it was a gift that, that that was on the table for me. And I think it was part of the reason I was so comfortable with it because, you know, things were just so volatile and it, it just seemed like, where are you going to put your dedication, it, it just seemed like I'm gonna go here where I know I have a place and, I, I, and my responsibilities are gonna be respected and I'm gonna have something that I, I can work towards that's not just gonna splinter or fall apart. Who are you now? S. V. Yeah. Yeah? You ready to rock? Here she goes! So everything's pretty much done. And, you know, we're, we're hitting 2001. And I don't have a clue what's going to happen with all the, the stuff that I've spent the last seven years uh, building. Jamie's starting to do sound now at House of Blues. You know, that's that's his job now. He's got a job doing that. And Ethan has left. He's doing something else. Greg is long gone. Elliot is just sort of waiting in the wings. And i am got this, this baby and this new life. But it's like, obviously, I'm still writing songs. And I think what did it, I tell you who I owe this huge debt of gratitude, is, is a woman named Danielle Parker. And she worked for Digidesign, the, uh, the company that ran Pro Tools. So she calls me up and she says, how would you like to do these software demos? And they couldn't pay any money, but they could uh, pay in a, in a big Pro Tools rig. I, I think having all that stuff at my disposal, like all the, all the, everything just 
lit back up to life and I just started going nuts. That's when we met Dan Brill. Jamie engineered my first band's CD. Uh, and um, so time went on, that, that first band, it's called 1350cc, if anybody remembers that, probably not. We sold like 10 CDs, but it was pretty good. And now the, the blood's starting to pump and we're starting to get this, and you know, we're starting to write some acumen stuff. And then I'm thinking, I, I've got this idea, I'm gonna put this record together. Somehow I'm gonna embrace the, the, the metal that we did, that we, we went off on a tangent with, but we're gonna bolster it with so much badass electronics and beats. I mean, this is gonna be the thing that we should have done next that we didn't, you know? I start writing what's gonna become, you know, the fifth column. Jamie's been doing some work with Pigface. I think he had just come back from a tour. And he calls me up and he goes, you know, I was telling Martin about how you've been, you know, thinking about putting this Acumen stuff out. Martin Atkins, who runs Invisible Records, has started this company called Underground Inc. And he says, I, I'd love to, you know, I'll put your Acumen record out, but you have that iron lung, you have your iron lung thing that you do, you, you have this DJ AccuCorrect thing that you do, you know, and now instead of just signing me your band, you can run your own label, you run your own imprint. And it just was like, holy shit, this is the greatest thing anyone's ever said. What's up, Greg? Our first show back is in February of 2002, and we open for Sister Machine Gun, and that place is just packed, and we play the oldies, and we play the newbies, and the machines are firing, and you know, the crowd is going, and that's our first show in 14 months, and we are frickin', I don't know, man, we're awesome. That, that show is great. We play like, like we've never played better, and Elliot is out there playing bass, Jamie's playing guitar, we've got Dan Brill on drums, and I, I, I mean, I watched footage from that show and I'm like, that's a confident group of motherfuckers. And next thing you know, everybody's writing about it, talking about it, going, Acumen's back. Best thing they've done since Territory, like, and that was 96, so it's, it's six years later. And they're going like, thank God this band is back. And, you know, it's a great feeling. It was good to be, to, to get back on track. <laughs> Not only do we have Fifth Column, the first Acumen record proper since 1997 coming out, now we have a new AccuCrack record that over the winter I've just gotten so jonesed up for that I start writing this AccuCrack record. Dope King was going to be this, 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 re this, this really bright record, you know, for me because it was just like the production it was just slamming. Everything's going great, but then I also get the opportunity to buy a home way on the burbs because I've got a second kid coming and I find a place that's affordable. But the most important thing to me, secretly, quietly, I'm sorry, love of my life, wife, it has this giant garage, right? In the back of my mind, I'm like, that's where my studio is. So we get the guy, all the guys, even Greg Lopez, I talked to for the first time in a couple years, and he gets excited about coming in and helping us. From an outsider's perspective, in that respect, you could see that um, the band really taking control of what was what was happening as far as like the recording process and everything. I think was making a better record. The Acumen record is done, but the AccuCrack record of 2002 is still getting its finishing finishing touches. And Dan Neat and I have decided that we're going to do another Iron Lung record. You know, after the Clay people kind of imploded, and I don't know necessarily know if we were done, but we were definitely breaking for a while. And I called up Jason. And I said, you know, I, you know, I'm not doing anything. I have some time. I, I, we know we have a little bit of money. I was like, uh, you know, I'd like to come out to Chicago, and you know, like let's let's write, you know, uh, another Iron Lung record. I go, but this time let's write it. You know, let's actually get in there and really kind of like really work these songs up, and you know, and, and really give it a face. And this is when Jamie and Paris are living together in this beautiful loft downtown, where they have this huge studio set up, and we fly in Dan Neat, and we spend a weekend 
like I've never done before where four guys just sit in a room with gear and bounce ideas off each other's head. And Jason turned to me, because you know, as you get these songs worked up, you know, and you're looking at each other, and you're like, this is fun, this is great. You know, this has substance to it. And he turned around to me and he goes, he says to me, this is how we rock it. And I go, that's the name of this song. This is how we rock it, which of course became the lead track on the Iron Lung record. Paris, the sound guy that we've been working for, said, I got an idea, and he said, me and Jamie and Dan meet down in our respective stations. This is how it works. I picked a sample. I'm not getting on camera. Okay. I, I picked a sample. You the all sample. record it at the same, you all grab it at the same time. Okay. And you all have five minutes to fuck with it to get it the way you want it. And then we listen to it after five minutes. In this corner, <laughs> we have from Albany, New York. Yes, Mr. Danny. Working on the corn triton, Danny. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hand. And kid cool. knobs on mini knobs ready. It's a tense battle. I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> one in the purely analog form, one in the high tech digital world, and one who can paste together anything with duct tape you give him. You watch this <laughs> shit work, bro. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a shame that uh, the, the, just the attitude didn't get didn't get it to do. Uh, I think all of us think that there are some great songs on there that you know, could have been, should have been. That's my favorite record of everything I've ever done. That's something I also love. I fucking love it. I fucking love that record with all my heart. So we've got four albums coming out on our new label when just six months prior we were dead. Dead in the water dead with nothing, and now we have our own label. It doesn't surprise me a bit that it became their own label, their own sort of production company, their own, you know, that they kept, they reclaimed the rights to all their releases and kept them out there and kept going. Being in two bands at once with the same people, it was, it was kind of neat, you know? Uh, no pun intended, because Dan and all that, but anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, I just put on a white shirt and a tie, and now you're in Iron Lung Corp. It was, it was killer. <laughs> Towards the end of 2002, you know, we were so excited about the fifth column record coming out and the, the momentum of this label that more we just started barfing acumen songs out left and right but now that i had the studio i had dan and elliot out here and jamie occasionally but then jamie it gets the job of a lifetime this massive tour it was saves the day and taking back sunday jamie's going to be gone for about six seven months could be longer he's floating this idea that maybe they're going to go to europe after and you know like and he's making really good money and House of Blues is holding his job for him and he can go do this. And he's thinking this might be the next step. And we're going, we just came back. You know, we, did, we went away, we just came back. But who could begrudge him for wanting a better shot at something? So we're like, okay, are you cool though? We have to keep going. So that was definitely the beginning of kind of a, I guess you can say a new version of Acumen Nation, starting with Lord of the Cynics. There's a lot of stuff on there, you know, it's newer, experimental. So we fin we, we finished recording this Lord of the Cynics record here and we produce it, but I don't know anything about, like, producing live instruments. I have to admit, we didn't know what the fuck we were doing. Jamie was gone and we put out a substandard record. I'll never forget, you know, while Outburn was busy giving it an eight and saying it was great and people were saying, wow, it's a really cool record. Somebody who really knew what they were talking about said that the snares are so thin you can filter your coffee through them. And I just can't ever get over that because they're right. That's on me though. I, I shouldn't have let a substandard product out of the house. But Jamie was gone and I, had to, I said I can do this, but I, I couldn't. Okay, we gotta play some shows and we don't want to ruin these opportunities and Jamie's gone and we don't know when he's coming back. You know, and when he comes back, he's gonna be fine, you know, he, but we can't just not play. We were thinking, well, you know, Jason, you, you sing better when you're not tied down to a guitar. And so it was like, okay, well, it'd be great then to have a second guitar. 
So when we got Brian involved, it was like, let's just have him be the guitarist for now with me, and then I can slowly transition out when Jamie comes back. And I'd just gotten back to school, and it was completely unexpected. It's like, hey, how would you feel about maybe playing some guitar and acting? And I think Jamie was cool with the situation, but I don't think he expected that I would still be around when he got back. And Brian stuck around, and, and Jamie came back from his tour, and boom, we, got two, we have two guitarists now, you know, and that was, I think we did that for, for a couple of tours. I got into grad school and left Acumen, and they were all really supportive, and Jamie's like, you know, I remember one night, he's like, dude, you know, I'm so glad you got into that awesome school, like, you know, that's, this, that's another one of your passions, so you gotta do it, he's like, don't feel bad, like, Acumen is, like, Jason and Mai is like, that's, this is our thing, this is our grad school, like, this is the thing that we can't drop. And it's like, so you should go and do that. And also, it probably meant that you didn't have to deal with me being a, tar a guitarist anymore, because now it's just, oh, I can do whatever the fuck I want. <laughs> so. When everything broke down a little bit, um, and I had a couple, you know, a year to realize that, you know, I had been making a mistake now over and over um, with Acumen now, where I, 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 you know, why keep this one band name and take all your ideas and try and put them into this band name? You know, I already think I'm you too, and and I can. You know, now this next record's gonna be this thing, and, and people just love what we do. But like, you got 4,000 people that like you. Fucking take it seriously. There's not enough numbers there to, to lose any percentage of that. And I think with Fawn, I, I had these ideas. I would come out here and I'd write and I'd work, and it was obvious that this was something that I wanted to do. But like, don't try to put this back in. To this project that you've like reclaimed as a, as a heavy, strong beast. When he started doing the Fawn stuff, um, that was a really cool thing for all of us because we were really into a lot of the Ken Andrews stuff. It was just really well done, Moody, My Bloody Valentine kind of thing. Perfect for Jason's voice. And I was really bolstered by the fact that people that were all like, oh, that's cool, I'm not really into like heavy music or I don't really like that. Like, they loved Fawn, right? Fawn is another one of Jason's musical babies, and you know, anytime he asks me to play drums on something, I'm elated because, cool, you know, I guess he likes me. <laughs> I guess I'm doing it, you know. Play slow, you know, feel it, get sad, get uh, get cold, get depressed. But I'll tell you what, man, I sent that shit out to every single club. We, I, I put a band together a couple times and we'd start learning the songs and we're like, I'm just, I gotta start playing with this. And no club in Chicago would, would book us. You know, I'd say, hey, we're the guys from Acting and this is our new side project and check it out. I never got a single call. Whatever it was, was just didn't work out or it wasn't their cup of tea. But I got incredibly discouraged by the fact that after a month of sending out, you know, tapes or CDs to clubs that nobody would book us to just open a local music night or anything. I was like, fuck this, and moved on. <laughs> 2003 is the first year that I am, uh, since having a kid, that I'm unemployed. And this was getting to the point where I was like, I'm probably gonna have to put a lot of this on hold. I'm probably gonna have to go get a job. And that job is not gonna allow me to have any sort of freedom. And literally, right when this realization comes, I get a phone call from Sasha from KMFDM out of the blue. It was just this opportunity. Would you guys like to come out and support us? And he actually said, I remember him saying, it could be either Acumen or AccuCrack. Like, he just wanted us to be a part of, and this is their 20th, 20 year anniversary tour. And it was just amazing, like the feeling that came over me of that kind of accolade. And then it worked out that if we did AccuCrack, we could be on their bus and 
you could also hire Jamie to do monitors. You know, and this was a great opportunity, and I, I, my wife was freaked out. I was going to be gone for seven weeks. I hadn't left on a proper tour in five years, you know, since way before we had kids. So now I was going to leave for seven weeks, but the money, I mean, we were going to be alive. We were going to be able to pay our bills. Everything was going to survive, and it was going to survive with me playing music, you know. This was great. Mako vs. Geist was the record that I was working on at the time, and this was my drum and bass opus. It was crushing leaving my family. And I went and experienced the first time in my life at, at 34 years old, I experienced uh, panic attacks, so anxiety attacks like I've never had any of those before. This guy gets up at six in the morning, makes lunches every day, makes sure these kids are out the door. You know, he's the one doing homework check, and he's just, he's an incredible dad. I was like, oh God, this is so, my, you know, Kelly's at home with these two little kids, and I'm gone, I, it just feels, so irresponsible. I'm playing in front of all these people and this is just so the king moment. Mom's was six months old. Like he had to leave his little man for six months. They played Metro, I think, maybe in the middle. I think it was probably about forty days in and they played Metro and I couldn't bring kids down there. I think he had like what four or five hours at home and, and he was sick. He was like, I can't go back out there. I was like, you gotta go to finish it. And then when we got off the tour and you know, some time had passed and uh, I was trying to figure out what to do next. When Killing Mobius came, the idea for it was sort of pushed, you know, by Martin, like, get another record going and we'll get behind you. You know, if, if you do another Aki Crack record, that's your money maker right now. That's where the most momentum is. So we started working on Killing Mobius and it was a different scenario for the first time working with Jamie and, 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 and working with putting out a record where I didn't have an ass load of ideas that were like the record is usually done. When it's time to do another record, I usually have 20 songs sitting in the in the tank. You know, that's why making that record to me was a little bit weird, and that's why I was sampling my kids' vacuum cleaner toys for the intro, and you know, trying to put a record together that had a lot more experimental aspects. more like experimental stuff because I remember we'd have like dying toys at the house and they're all like oh, slowed yeah. down and he'd take them and just record them and put them in all of his songs. My daughter did some experiment at school. She just took this piece of orange construction paper and started taking a piece of a screen, like a window screen, and dipping pieces in it and making the pattern. So that artwork is just non completely non-manipulated scans of her, of that piece of art. I just thought that was so cool, like that this this child just came home with this amazing piece of art that that you know was so intense. I loved it. So after Acumen finished Lord of the Cynics and that you know didn't go as well as we thought, and you know the record we'd made without Jamie at the end, and we weren't happy with it. We immediately were like, you know, we obviously all love this process, and Jamie was pretty much sounded like he was back for good. You know, at this point, you know, here we were again going through another phase where all the people in the band are starting to listen to stuff that has nothing to do with industrial music or dance music. And, and Cold Wave is generally dead now. I mean, there's no, there's no guitar machine rock really prominent at all. Metal is huge, and metal has a great scene, and we are all just inebriated with metal. So we started writing and recording Anacor over the next two years, and it put you know, we had so much fun in the studio and we worked our asses up. We were going all out on that one. Uh, very, very different <laughs> uh, of an album. We just had such a purpose and so much effort and it was like all or nothing, 15 tracks. Let's, what's the next album? I don't know if there's gonna be a next album. We're not gonna save a track. We're not gonna hold anything back. interested in releasing it through Crack Nation because we just didn't have any input into the metal scene or like no any way to reach these people and Crash Records seemed to like it so we were, like, we're like this is it man now we're finally gonna get to reach a different group of people and Crash Records turned out to be hands down the worst company that we ever worked with in terms of communication 
of promotion. And so what we ended up doing is, I think, I hope I can say this, we, we pirated the barcode and just made a bunch of them ourselves and sold them. <laughs> Very anti-core. I, I think that that album kind of took a toll on me. It just reached the, reached the point where musically it, was, it wasn't as fulfilling. So I had an opportunity and I uh, jumped into the escape hatch. left and uh, you know we had just come off this huge two-year run of collaboration and really getting excited again you know and that excitement when it doesn't pan out just makes you feel like a fool and uh, there's, it's like what are we gonna do and that's where I was like all right fuck this collaboration and I'm not going out like that the band the guy, band guys have kind of left the building you're left alone you still have this label you still have this identity, this is still something that you'll do to the day you die. And that's why I was like, I'm not done yet. And the idea for him to, to do two albums at the same time, Psycho the Rapist and Humanoids from the Deep. And I, I knew what they were going to be called before I wrote one song. I knew what the artwork was going to look like. I, I knew that they were going to be dark albums. Now with Anacor, I know we had flirted with it, but as far as I was concerned, while finishing um, at, uh, Psycho the Rapist, it felt like this could be a goodbye. You know, this could be, this, I'm okay with this now. So when that record, you know, is coming together and coming out and I, Acumen tre Trepanation, it's just like, you're, you're actually gonna name the song with the band name and the title. I'm like, okay, MFDM does it all the time, right? So I can do it. But uh, that song is 10 minutes long, it's an opus, and I think it's one of the best songs that I have ever written. And, I, and I'm like, that's the last Acumen song that's ever, you know, that's, I, I was pretty sure that would be the last acting song. I'll never say never, but, you know, to me that felt like a way to go out. We put these two back-to-back -to -back tours together for 2007, 2008. And we rented this little short bus and bringing Aki Crack and Acumen and Cyanotic was a real embrace for me to say, I want to, to be back with the people that I haven't realized have been there for us the whole time. And I thought, humbly, like here are these two records, I finally have realized what I've been missing. I'd love the opportunity to take this out on tour and perform Gun Lover and Matador and Fuckface and Gent and Candy Proud and all the things that you know we ran, or ran from. These tours would come up and Jason would be terrified to tell me. You know, and, and he, he'd look at me and he's like, I have to go do this, you know, and he did have to go do this because it was something inside of him that he needed to do, but at the same time, he's looking at me and he's looking at these kids and he's like, how can I do it? And he'd get out there and that first week was horrible. Well, he'd call us every single day and he's like, did I, make a, did I make a bad decision? And I'm like, no. You know, of course I didn't say that at the time. I'm like, I need your cards, I need your cards, you know. Actually, I thought it was kind of fun because we'd like spend uh, like days or weekends at our family's house, our friend's house. But I thought it was also like fun. We would Skype. Yeah, we'd Skype, and then he'd tell us about like his tour experience, or like he'd send back a video of like what he did on stage earlier that day, which I thought was pretty cool. You know, we had Jamie out, and it was myself and Ethan, and uh, and Dan Brill, and it was it was cool that Ethan, after all these years came back and said, you know, I'd, if you need it, I'd love to be a part of this. I had to face it. I wasn't really ready to leave my family at that point and, and to bolt and handle all of the stress. And I, I had worked people calling me and I didn't want to let them know that I was out because I'm a freelancer. So I was like, oh sure, I'll have that for you in a little bit. And I'm in the back of that damn van trying to do work and pull over, pull over this gas station. I got to upload something now or I'm going to fucking get, lose my job, you know. I missed Elliot, you know, but it was like my brother's back, and that's like an original beast. And you know, I, I it was it was fun to have to have my brother back on stage with me again. Hey, 
Anybody recognize this guy? I don't see his face through all that fucking hair. Ethan, my brother, I love you. Thank you for coming out and playing with us again. So we came back with this sense of like, okay, we did it. You know, Jamie was like, I need to get back to my job now. And, and Dan was like, I need to get back to my students. Ethan was like, I need to get back to L.A. And I was like, okay, I, di I followed it through. Put the albums out, did what I said I was going to do, tried to make everybody happy, made sure to get out and tour. And it was like, okay, and the results are so-so. But, you know, I, I can't do this anymore. You know, it's just like pulling teeth. I, I don't have a song left in me. I honestly, to this day now, it's four years later, five years later, since writing those albums, I have not written one Aki Cracker Acumen song in five years. And there was nothing really going on. And so uh, I figured, well, my stuff is all over at Crack Nation Studio, and that's where I need to practice because I don't have any other place to, to go. I'm in the studio playing some drums, working some parts out, composing. Jason comes in and says, what the hell are you doing? What is this? What? And then he picked up a guitar and started to, to play along because a lot of the parts were not in 4-4 time. They're, they're kind of all over the place. He and I ended up just playing the, the two of us for a good, you know, six months, six, seven months. And then Jason called me up and he goes, this should be a band. We should like do something with this. That's how Zara was born. It was born out of nothing. It was very spontaneous. We played, we like, you know, we're like, we need, we need some more in here, you know, we need a third party, and who do we call? Brian Elza. Hey Brian, remember those old days of playing with Acumen and coming to see Acumen, and I think we got along pretty well, you seem like a, like a like-minded dude, you want to join this band. And so I get this disc, it's like really nebulous, slow metal, except the drums are crazy, and Jason's like, so yeah, see if you can like come up with some riffs for that. We didn't have to right with the Acumen hat on, or the Fawn hat, or the Iron Lung Corporation hat. You know, it was just, here's a bunch of stuff. It's just art. The most exciting thing about Zara was that we were gonna play in the shittiest clubs and ask for no money, and if they gave us a pitcher of beer and we got to be on a stage once a month and still could play music, I, I, had, I felt like I had won. That was the first time with Jason, at least, that like I had complete creative control alongside him on stuff I was doing, not just like, hey, come record this guitar part, or eh, I'm gonna mix you down. It's like, nope, no more of that, Dunzo. Like, this is now officially all three of our babies. One of the things about working with Dan and Brian is like, their ideas trump mine a whole bunch. Like, I learned so much from the stuff that they come up with. And I'm not saying that, I think my brother's an amazing songwriter, and Jamie was an amazing programmer and a great guy, but like, they would just allow me to be the biggest ego in the room, and so I would just go with it. It just was exciting to be a, a, you know, a pupil for once and to be the one playing catch up with other guys that I was playing with. The process for writing for Vertical Mass Grave was very effortless. I mean, we're just having fun, you know. We recorded that um, at Matt Talbot's studio. Um, the guy from home, he's a really cool guy. Uh, great live room. The budget was crazy tight. It was just all our merch money that we had made over the course of like a year and a half. But we were able to finance everything ourselves and put it on a vinyl, which is like no small feat. Because uh, we had to do a lot. In order to do it within a limited budget, you have to like get every piece made somewhere else and shipped around. And yeah, it's it's a process. But I, yeah, I don't regret it. I don't think we've made our money back on doing vinyl yet, but we will. When Jamie was 16, his father, um, whom he didn't know, but he'd spoken to once briefly, um, but they, you know, didn't know each other, um, he committed suicide. And, well, we don't know if it was, I mean, it was accidental, 
Um, but I always wondered what kind of impact that would have on Jamie. Now I know. I was in this room, I was working on something and it was about 10 in the morning um, and I got a call from Pat and she's like fighting back tears and she goes I have some really bad news and she's like Jamie's dead. There was a window to help but it wasn't open very wide he could have reached out a little bit more. You know I, I never called her mom I called her mom a kid but I just kept going oh mom mom I'm so sorry you know, I don't know, what, and I, I remember kept, I kept making excuses like, I don't know what to say. I don't know what happened that last night. Um, ten days before he died, he called me and he said, you know, when you couldn't get through to me about my drinking, Evan did. And he's like, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna get help. He said, I've tried to quit before, but I can't quit because I'm addicted. And he couldn't just quit because when he tried, his body wouldn't let him. I was thinking a lot of ways. He just got bogged down and didn't have it to like get himself back up to where he needed to be, to rise above that. You know, but he just, he was a workaholic, you know, in a good way. But I think it flipped for him. I think he just started like just doing too much work and not having enough life. And I think that when all you see is the darkness and all you see are unhappy people and you see a lot of people that are drinking and people that are very nihilistic and all you're doing is working and all you're doing is working and drinking and you just, you forget that there is that whole world out there, that there is normalcy out there, you know? And all of us that knew him and loved him was like, were like, you, you, you're so talented and you make good money and you have all these opportunities. You're living a substandard life for no reason that none of us get. I thought I was hurting really bad and then I saw my kids and I was like, wow, you know, he was such an important part of our family. And, but to see these two little people they loved him just as much as I did, and they only knew him for half the time I did. That was really hard for me. You know, and, and when we started Zara, I just, I hope that he would like go like, God, I wish I was playing music with you again. I would feel, I'd hold, grab him in my arms and be like, then let's play some music together. You know, but deep down I wanted to impress him with Zara. I wanted him to say like, Jason, I've never seen you like play metal guitar like that. I'm proud. You know, I'm proud that you guys have this heavy metal fucking band, you know, and we always wanted him to be proud of us. And I never really thought that that maybe he was sad and he didn't come to our shows and maybe he was bummed that we were doing something without him. There's just so many things that we should have said to each other over those last couple years. And there's so many moments that we should have had these conversations about. You know, we should have been able to say to each other, like, this is my relationship to you for real. You know, and I do feel like I want your approval, you know, and, you know, and I do feel happy that you backed me up all these years being this, you know, the face of our group and this industrial thing when I wanted nothing to do with it. Maybe part of him felt somebody would have found him just in time to go to the hospital to, to pump him out and then he could finally say, yeah, <laughs> I, really, I'm serious, you guys. I'm not, I mean, I'm not good, I need, I need help. I just would really hate to think that he, I mean, I know what it's like to get to that point, but But he, you know, he chose it, whether he really meant it or not, he chose it. And if, you know, 
you deal with the devil or whatever it is or whatever dark slope that you go down. I mean, once you, there's, you know, at some point there's no turning back, you know? And I was really taken by instantly thinking, Jamie, Jamie's dead and I, I was like, we have to do something, his mother needs some help. We need to put something together so people can come and mourn and be together and do this. And that was where my brain went. Without Facebook, I would have thought that I was alone in all of this, you know what I mean? I would have thought, who cares? It's just, you know, who cares? I, I lost, all I know is I lost my son and he was everything that I had ever, everything I ever did, everything I ever wanted, everything I, you know, I, everything I sacrificed for, everything was for him. And I just wanted him to be happy. Then it became apparent that all the band people that I talked to and all the people that, that like, that what had to happen was some sort of celebration of music and sound and and we had to do this, so we put this. We, we started putting together a thing for a show, um, and it just seemed this is what we're doing now. This is what we have to do. We needed to raise some money so our friend could be put to rest properly. And uh, you know, he said to me, you know, would you come out and perform? Before I left Albany, the Clay people, you know, we've talked about getting back together. You know, we've talked about it. That's about it. I can't imagine that anybody that was asked said no unless they had something that they absolutely positively had to do somewhere else. Having all these people get together that we all essentially really liked gave us an opportunity to pretend like the last 20 years didn't happen, you know? And no one got sad and no one felt alone and no one died. The vibe was so good. It was literally egos checked out the door. Like if, if this person had a problem with this person years ago, don't matter. He was a glue to a lot of this music. He held a lot of these bands' friendships together because he was the agreeable, fun, knew how to do it badass, you know? It was kind of a family vibe. Like our, we were amongst friends and we never felt like we weren't in a home environment. And that was a really cool thing to, to make out of that. I mean, 16 volt clay people. I never thought that I would see any of those bands on the same bill ever again. I haven't seen Dan Neat for probably 15 years, you know. So to see all these guys like come together again and, you know, celebrate who Jimmy was and what he did and, you know, just to kind of like honor who he was and what he did. To see all the people that got, have gotten involved in this. Dan Neat. And I both kind of went on hiatus at the same time, and we're coming back for, for this purpose, um, you know, for, for Jamie. It goes to show that this whole scene is a family. You know, as, as tough as the music is, and as scary as we all look sometimes, we're the nicest people you're ever going to meet. And it's so hard for me to... I can't possibly convey how much it meant to me that they did that. And when it came time to pulling off cold waves, and one of the, the greatest things that we did was we put 13 bands on in six hours or seven hours. And there was so much time that I would say, like, you fucking asshole. You know, I don't want to do this without you. I don't know how to, to produce a show like this, and I don't know how to pull it off alone. I, I guess we weren't alone because there's only one person that could pull that off. So whatever you believe in, like, it could easily just be his energy within all of us. Or maybe something bigger than that. But yeah, we, he was there. Because there's no way we would have pulled anything off like that without him. Especially me. You know, a lot of people all said over and over, couldn't thank you, Jason. Thanks, Dave Shock. Like, these guys did more than anybody could do and you know I just started to look at it as like I didn't have a choice you know I owed it Jamie for everything that he did for all those people and everything that he did for me to do one for him so I think it worked out it was cool
But now, and I don't know if it's post cold wave syndrome or whatever, but the plan now is to spend the winter in the studio and we're gonna write and record a new Czar record. I'm gonna write and record a new Aki Crack record. And at this stage, we've discussed and pretty much committed to a third Iron Lung record. I'm lucky that I get to still work with Jason and still work with Brian. And it's still under the umbrella of Crack Nation. It's still got that spirit in there, you know. Um, pretty much a culmination, Zara is a culmination of all the years that we've played music together. Dan and I have, you know, we, we've both been energized a little bit about, uh, you know, about playing again. And, you know, there's, we're, we'll ta we're taking one thing, one step at a time, you know, one thing at a time. Jamie has basically let me know that it, it's, you're not quite done yet. You're not quite done. Not quite done with the Iron Lung, you're not quite done with the clay people. The Iron Lung thing is going to be so much fun for the people involved that if a hundred people buy it, I don't care, we're going to be laughing all the way into our 50s about this fucking, you know, covering, you know, whatever song that we've always wanted to cover, always wanted to do, however we do it, and it'll make us happy. And that's, to me, that what I've learned over these 20 years of making music was the pitfalls and the mistakes you make are always going to be when you're not thinking about just making yourself happy. And I'm 16 years old again when I say that. And I'm in my basement with my dual cassette decks and I'm trying to figure out why can't I make, you know, the beginning of Computer Blue by Prince last the length of the song because it's so badass. And that little part in Waiting for the Worms by Pink Floyd, like that little thing, like why don't they do that like eight more times? Getting back into making music to make something that I like, that I just want to listen to at age 42 and after doing this for 20 years, it, it, feels, it feels fine. It feels really good actually. I'm, I'm fortunate. People love to tease me about how many times I've said I'm, I'm done or you know, I'm finished, this is my last one. But I, I, I have to know deep down that as long as my family is fine and I have a breath left in me, I'll never stop. Because it's who we are, it's what I am and I love it.
I think like... Fuck you, Jason! <laughs>